Hello, and welcome to the Randomly Generated History Club, where three, count them, three. Unos, non- dos. Uno, unos, just, doses, three, three. three. That's good. Uh, yes, all three of us non-historians will pick a year at random and try to learn things about it. I'm Anna, and I am here with my two friends, William and Anthony. Hello. Hello, hello. How many credits does this go towards an actual history degree? Because I want to stop saying non-historian and say <laughs> actual qualified historian. It's actually a really interesting point. Because like, if you think about, <laughs> yeah. you know, we've we've each done it like a kind of, I don't know, how long is our little our bit each time? Like 10 minutes Ten-ish, or something? yeah. And how many episodes have we done now? This is, I like, believe, episode 52. 52? Yeah. So we've done more history than I would say most undergrad historians. We've done 10 times 50 minutes of history each. Wow. I went to uni with a lot of historians. They didn't really go to lectures that often. Okay, you are talking to a history graduate. Are you a history graduate? So you're at, so wait, so when you say three non-historians, you mean two non-historians and someone who is a historian? I mean, technically, my degree is in Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> it did involve a lot of history. Mm. I did go to class. Yeah, the Near East, what the like time. Norfolk, Suffolk, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Norfolk. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wanted to do a degree in the in the history of the West Islington. West Midlands, but right. the course was full. Ah, yes, yeah, so yeah. I had to go to the Near East. <laughs> Ask me anything about Peterborough, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> this week, as historians, we are going to talk about the year eight hundred. A pivotable, yes. a pivot, pivotable. What we are it? historians. We're two not linguists. Two fat ducks and two zeros. Two one fat lady and two zeros. <laughs> That's the one. That's the one. Uh, now let's each give our three word preview of what we're discussing today. Ant. Big boss man. Big boss man. Uh, was sorry. Was that just you asking Will to go? <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I'll do mine. <laughs> Unbroken bridge eggs. <laughs> That's my favorite Tony Braxton song. I almost spat. That was very good. (laughs) Unbroken bridge eggs. And mine is clast or file. Clast. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Clast. Is clast a word? Nope. Oh. It's a suffix. Okay. Not Ah. to not to give too much away. Like an iconoclast. Maybe. You might have hit the magic button there. Yeah, hit the magic button. That's not the phrase. Well, uh, it's a phrase. <laughs> it's not even Valentine's Day. Yeah. What? <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and start the podcast. All right. Today, I'm talking about a very important history lady. History lady that I'd never heard of before. Oh wow! Classic. Her name was Irene of Athens. Oh, yes. no, right. Yes. Yeah, so I think, Aunt, today we you overlap. and I are going to overlap a We're bit. We're going to overlap a bit, yeah. So if I ever start to encroach on your territory... I'll hold up the red card. Deal with it, because I'm going first. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So Irene of Athens was a Byzantine empress who came to power in 769 when she married Byzantine Emperor Leo IV. Nice. Um, It's apparently unclear why she married him because her family, the Sarantepekos, yep, yep, nailed it, wasn't particularly noble or important. And he was the Byzantine emperor. So you would expect him to get some like really good high class useful marriage but nope just got little old irene uh and she and her husband's family had a pretty crucial element of their faith that was at odds which i'll get to in a, in a second but uh the mystery of why he chose her has led to some scholars suggesting that she was chosen at a bride show which is exactly what it sounds wow. like eligible young women are paraded before the bridegroom until wow. one is finally selected wow so it's like it's like Picking football teams, yeah, but exactly. way more misogyny. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think that means we can safely uh. <laughs> say Irene of Athens was hot. Yeah, that's true. She survived. Yeah, that's right? true. I think uh, definitively, yeah. definitely must have picked her. She was not in goal. <laughs> I was always the goalie when we were playing. So you, and you can go in goal. That that's because you're tall and strapping. Uh, I was slightly less athletic, I think, when I was... Was younger, I think. Boy, that's a low bar. Wow. <laughs> no, the- just kidding. You're such a good man. Well, didn't Prince William pick out Kate Middleton in a similar... In a bride show. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was at the Excel Center, I think. I think that's right. Yeah. There actually is still a 
thing like this in Ireland called Liston Varna, which is kind of a singles fair. It's not quite Ooh. this exactly, but it's like it's Are where singles applicants? go. Are they taking applicants? You can go, any, anyone can go and it's like everyone gets together and it's literally a festival for single people to meet and it's from back in the day when like farmers would be out in the field in the wilds, they'd meet nobody. Yeah. It's like, we need to sort this whole declining population thing and all these weird old people in the middle of nowhere. And so they um, made this Liston Varna Festival which is still going on to this day every year. It's a massive piss up. You can go and maybe meet the love of your life or... I mean, I genuinely want to go, especially it's because actually, as you told us a few episodes ago, the Vikings took all the hot people from Ireland. <laughs> so I feel like I'll oh, be yeah. able to you're, find you're someone. You're like an Irish nine. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So uh, this Byzantine 10, Irene of Athens, uh, the drama with her and Leo comes down to this. Are you an iconophile or an iconoclast? Oh, wow. I got it right. You got it mm-hmm. right. I'm genuinely very proud of you. Uh, so for hundreds of years, this tension had been building in the Byzantine Empire and also sort of between the Byzantine and the Romans, so the East and the Western churches, uh, between people who venerated religious icons, the iconophiles, mm-hmm. and people who rejected them, saying that venerating icons was a form of idolatry, which is, of course, prohibited by the Second I mean, Commandment. I love Prince. <laughs> he is an icon and I do venerate him. So call me an iconophile. Uh, no, the people who thought it was idolatry were the iconoclasts. And of course, this has evolved into having a, a different meaning. Um, but that is where it started. And in the 8th and 9th centuries, a few Byzantine emperors became very strong iconoclasts and moved moved for widespread destruction of religious images in churches and really quite heavy penalties for those who were caught with icons. Burp. Leo the Fourth was an iconoclast, and Irene, though she proclaimed to be iconoclastic as well, definitely had some iconophile sympathies. In fact, one time Leo found some icons hiding underneath her pillow, Ooh. and he <laughs> found out who had given them to her, and had those people tortured. Oof! And his penalty for Irene, his punishment for Irene. Any guesses? Mm. He just said, come on. <laughs> I'm not I mad. I'm disappointed. Yeah. Oh, come on. That's very come good. Come on, Irene. That's very good. Very good. Yeah. Ironically. Oh, boy. I really want to make a joke, but it's very dirty because... Make the joke. We can cut it out of Okay. Bad. Ironically, he never came on her again because <laughs> her punishment was no more sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was her punishment. No more sex. Yeah, he ref- he refused to engage with mar- in marital relations with her ever again. Yeah. yeah. So she might be like, "Thank God, <laughs> I know these icons are working." Well, but she was hot, so you have to think mm. that it's more of a punishment for him. Yes, yeah, odd. I apologize to all the families listening for that uncouth joke. Uh, you no, know, multiple generations of families gather around the wireless to listen to this. <laughs> every, Freedom Radio every other Tuesday, yeah, they're listening yeah. to their attics in like in, in occupied <laughs> Netherlands. And they're like That's twiddling right. the dials to yeah, see if yeah. they can pick up the frequency. One piece of hope as we send our coded messages to them to where exactly. they can pick up the they parachute need, yeah, drop. Exactly, yeah. there'll well, be a priest in your village with a British accent. <laughs> You've misled the resistance. Oh my God, I'm so How sorry. Dare you? I'm hell. so sorry. It's because right, continue I continue your pro Nazi tirade. I've secretly been working for the other side. I don't actually want to say that. All right. So, <laughs> anyway, oh Irene had some icons on her pillow. Leo found out, punished her, her punished her. <laughs> and there we go. Anyway, Leo dies in 780. Good riddance, and Irene becomes the regent for their son, Constantine the Sixth. Uh, her reign is challenged, of course, because people don't like having a lady on the throne. If we've learned one thing in the course of this podcast, it's that. Uh, but she keeps taking more and more power for herself, which we love. She doesn't let her child have any voice in public affairs, which we love. (laughs) (laughs) And she puts herself on coins and kind of she like on the front of the coin, it's like Irene and a big picture of her. And then on the back and kind of tiny writing, she's like, and Constantine, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Now, the last female regent of the Byzantine Empire survived for less than a year before her tongue was cut out and she was exiled to Rhodes. So Irene is maybe consolidating all of this power, knowing that there is like 
a hatchet hanging above her head, and that she might not be long horrific. for this world. That is so barbaric. I know. Rose I know. is disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> of all the places. Uh, but despite the prospect of year, a year, a life sentence on Rhodes, she mm. keeps going. And one of the most notable things she does during her reign is to end this schism between the iconoclasts and the icon- iconophiles. In 787, at the Second Council of Nicaea, the council concludes that the veneration of icons is permissible, and this helps heal the rift between Eastern and Western churches, as well as the rift within the Eastern Byzantine church. And Irene gets a lot of credit for that and gains a reputation as a peacemaker, which is ironic, given what comes next. (laughs) As Constantine gets older, he starts to resent the heavy handedness of his mother and her regency and tensions rise between the two of them. And they uh, have a diumvirate for a little while where they actually try to be co-rulers. But eventually Irene and her powerful eunuch minister, uh, so say the history books, start to crack down on any opposition. And in 797, she organizes a conspiracy against Constantine. Her allies seize him and blind him, throw him in jail, and then it's a little unclear, but probably he died pretty soon after that. Irene then asserts herself as the sole monarch, making her the first ever empress ruling in her own right in Roman and Byzantine imperial Mm -hmm. history. So, you know, that's good. That's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. Hot girl done good, except also killed her son along the way. Yeah. Uh, And of course, her being the sole empress made lots and lots of men very uncomfortable and leads to people putting a lot of support behind Charlemagne, which I think Ant will talk about in a minute. Uh, But anyway, Irene has a nice little five years as empress. And in those five years, the year 800 happens, which is (laughs) great, I would say. And then in 802, her conspirators get the best of her. They kick her out. They put her minister of finance on the throne. They exile Irene to the Isle of Lesbos. No comment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Good. Very mature. And they force her to support her. (laughs) Lesbian. Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) Jesus. I don't know where that came from. Yep. You do just periodically (laughs) shout that. (laughs) It's my, it's my tick. <laughs> um, uh, and while she's on Lesbos, they force her to support herself by spinning wool. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Which is, I mean, a fate worse than death. I say this as someone who is is flirting with the idea of taking up knitting. You hate looms. As a hobby. I do hate looms. Yeah, and, but it. until I go to the Sylvan Fox hunt, what did you call the Irish thing? What, Liston Varna. Liston Varna. The Sylvan Fox Hunt is a different dating <laughs> festival. <laughs> the same number of For syllables. older men. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, until I go on that, I'm, I do have to support myself by spinning wool. Amazing. Uh, and uh, Irene died in the year 803. Okay. That's her. Gosh. That's Irene of good. Athens. Irene. She did pretty well. She did all right. She okay. had a good run there for a while. Yeah. You know, it's a good bit of trivia at least. Bit of sun aside. I don't know what it's called when you kill your son. It's fratricide of your father. Phyllis- matricide. Phyllicide, maybe? Is it phyllicide? I don't know. Son aside. Fratricide's your brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fratricide's you your brother. Kill Patricide, Phyllis- matricide. Phyllis- 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 child. Regicide is a king. Boy, howdy, I don't like Googling this. Phyllicide. Yep. Phyllicide. Child murder by parents ah. is one of the most upsetting types of crime. Oh yeah. my God. <laughs> is that what it says? That's what the National Institutes of Health say. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to stop reading that. Anyway, yeah. Way to she... bring it down, me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She did good. Uh, good bit of trivia for you there. First ever... Empress Regnant in her own right in Byzantine and Roman history. Appreciate that. Okay, me. Me, me, me. Big boss man. Charlemagne. (laughs) Charlemagne. Or Charles the Great, who is, of course, an absolutely pivotal figure in European history, as we tend to discuss pivotal things. Um, but he is the most pivotal of all. If he was a pivot, he'd be the biggest one. Oh boy. Um, Filler. <laughs> no, we'll be discussing him today. First of all, I want you to tell me, what was Charlemagne's second name? What was the second name? Anybody? Pierre. Pepin. Pepin. Ooh. Pe- Pepin's son. Pepin. Pepinson. Wrong. 
He didn't have a second name uh-huh. because at this time in early medieval period, people pretty much didn't have a, a second name. They just had a single name and possibly a descriptor. Charlemagne, for example, just means the combination of Charles and Magnus, meaning Charles the Great. So Charlemagne the Great is Charles the Great the Great. Which Good is, thing no one calls him Charlemagne the Great. That's true. Uh, I do. Uh, his Latin name <laughs> is Carolus Magnus and in Frankish it's Carl. <laughs> Uh, on second names actually fascinating in Europe second names became common around the 900s ish for nobility to show their lineage and in the UK after the Norman conquest and only by the 1400s was it very common and regular for commoners to have surnames so you wouldn't have a surname and that's where a lot of the names like Cook and Smith and that kind of stuff come from your trade and all that kind of stuff but it was not seen as a normal thing to have a second name That's why it's such a great irony that I was born and a podcaster and that's what I became I mean how <laughs> yeah, many Smiths are actual yeah, Smiths that's true. Uh, So he ruled what is known as the Carolingian Empire or the Frankish Empire uh, or the Empire of Karl um, <laughs> he was born in April on April second, seventeen forty-seven, under a gibbous moon. <laughs> oh my God, Aunt, this is just so much. You're welcome. There's so much about him. Anyway, uh, as the eldest son of, yes, you were right, Pepin the Short, who is he known, and Bertrada of Leon, uh, Charlemagne ascended the throne as king of the Franks in seventeen seven sixty-eight after his father's death, um, despite being born out of wedlock so he was not born within the confines of the marital marriage bastardo yeah sure Um, anyway little is known about him in some ways except that he was born under a gibbous moon (laughs) that part I may have well you can look up April 2nd and see what the moon state was like okay I didn't do that I'm just guessing a gibbous moon oh Jesus so So that 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 fact isn't even true that was a lie. We're off to the races. Anyway, but uh, he did have a biographer called Einhard who described him as tall, strong, and dignified. Oh. He was fond of physical pursuits like horseback riding and swimming and ruling. And his <laughs> reign united vast territories across present day France, Germany, Italy, all over. And this had not been done since the Roman Empire itself. So he was the actual bringer together of all these disparate nations. So, he also brought about the Carolingian Renaissance as a result because of the increased trade and movement of people, thoughts, ideas and relative stability. This flourished under his rule and marked a resurgence in art, culture and education. And he was a massive proponent of religious reforms and education as long as it was Christian. Um, Sure. And this catalyzed this cultural awakening in Western Europe and sort of give massive advances and advantages to, to, to Western Europe over other places in the world, relatively speaking. The, uh, uh, it was in 800, the year 800, on Christmas Day, he gave himself the greatest present of all, where he uh, was crowned Emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III, which was a, uh, a title that had fallen out of use since the Roman time. And now it was a significant point where he was, you know, King of the Romans. And uh, Santa em- Claus. And Santa Claus. And he was also given the title Father of Europe. Ooh, oh, wow. And Christmas. And Christmas. Great, great Father Europe. Um, who comes along and leaves you social reforms or something. Like yeah, he comes well. along and leaves you Swedish style socialism. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Charlemagne's unification of Western Europe laid the groundwork for Europe for centuries to come and arguably even to this day, where I'm sure that the whole basis of the EU is just awaiting his return. <laughs> um, <laughs> he centralised power as well through a new form of ruling where he established what's called a capitulary for the Missi, uh, is one frame, there's other frames for it, the capitulary, which is appointing local representatives accountable directly to him, which means he had direct like fingers in pies. The pies mm. were many, his fingers were numerous mm-hmm. and he was all over it, and so he's getting a direct source of power so Carl the multi-fingered he he established a new sort of ruling class effectively you know there were still the kings and local rulers and stuff but these were like the proponents of his his edicts and stuff so he managed to centralise power power through the sort of back door which is great Um, so his policies as we said favoured the church obviously and he maintained this complex relationship with the Eastern Orthodox Church which we sort of touched on there with Irene Um, partly actually due to his support of the Philippe clause. So in the the Nicene uh, in 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 the um, uh, in the diocese, uh, sorry the the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea. What's called the Nicene Creed, which is one of the prayers, references um, 
a line which says the uh, Holy Spirit comes from the Father and the Son. Some people say it's the Father, some people it's the Father and the Son. And so there's this rift of like, oh, this is like denuding or diluting what the Holy Spirit is and stuff. So effectively it gets the heart of Christianity of like the 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 uh, the Trinity. Is there a Trinity? Is So like it's a fundamental schism in a very, very small way of just two words difference in a single prayer. Mm. And so there's this massive difference in East and West just based on two words. Um, uh, and that was, that was, that's the main difference really. So he had rivalry obviously with the Empress Irene uh, who was the advocation for the veneration of icons uh, in, or sorry, uh, he was an advocation for icons and she was kind of nominally not, although she kind of was. He loved iconography and this is sort of a testament in, in many of his like artistic works at the time and stuff like that. Um, and this led basically to the East-West schism and this is still prevalent today in the sort of orthodox churches of Eastern Orthodox and sort of Catholic Western churches as well. He was also a massive military nerd, uh, amazing campaigner. Uh, he uh, was a bit brutal, though, in his efforts spreading Christianity. For example, the massacre of Erden, um, where he he just basically just came along and said, uh, "Be Christian, or we'll slaughter Verdun. you." And you're done. And he he uh, apparently uh, crucified and slaughtered thousands of people. He, he literally crucified them. Literally crucified. Yeah, 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 yeah. Crucifixion. Very in. Wow. Yeah, uh, he was also prolific in his personal life. He was just a go-getter. He's married four times Ooh. and fathered many, many children. Um, only I think three or four survived till, till adulthood. It's not quite clear. Uh, and then Louis, Louis, not Louis, Louis the Pious succeeded him after his death. Um, but in effect, Charlemagne, his reign, profound, set the stage for the Holy Roman Empire after, and influenced the future of Europe forevermore. And the Carolingian Renaissance spurred and, res- and actually helped preserve a lot of classical knowledge and culture. So a lot of the works and stuff only are there because he managed to sort of have this coherent time of sort of relative peace and calm for yeah. a while. One of the reasons he was crowned is because people said that since Irene was a woman, there was actually no Byzantine Roman Empire emperor. Yeah. So they needed to put somebody in. Oh, wow. In, in in the place and they picked him. Oh, yeah. wow. Interesting. Also, did he have a son named Pepin the Hunchback? <laughs> I think he might have, yeah. As I'm reading Wikipedia, which I do, on this, I'm not being facetious every day, uh, I have a spreadsheet with a list of things that might be interesting to talk about if the RNG ever blesses us with the year. And I've had Pepin the Hunchback on there for so long because yeah, it was, what a um, great... Guy. Yeah, he was. He was. He was the son of Charlemagne, but he didn't actually take over. I think potentially. I don't know that he survived. Or no, I think. Yeah, I think he yeah, maybe yeah. have. And that's why maybe uh, died. his his son, who is much more pious, did. Anyway, Louis. Uh, anyway, but uh, in summation, really, Charlemagne, top bloke, one of the four biggest leaders in history, along with. Let's have him. Uh, Charlemagne. Yep. Number one. Yep. Obviously, Genghis Khan. Yep. Uh, Louis Thoreau. <laughs> 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 one of the top leaders in history. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, has he done anything that's not brilliant? Name one thing he's done that's not brilliant. Yeah, no, I can't. It's true. Yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. Okay, Charlemagne, Genghis Khan, Louis Thoreau. And number four, I'm running for MP of Camden. <laughs> Aunt is, Aunt is standing. So, okay, you're preemptively, I would say, putting yourself number four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Considering yeah, yeah, you're yeah. not yet a leader. Nice. Uh, I mean, I consider myself a leader. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, okay. you guys follow me. That's a good top four then. <laughs> uh, but I like, for th- this guy is just incredible. I can't believe there's not some sort of major motion picture starring Joaquin Phoenix or something that's like, you know, about his life. Like, why isn't there? It's, he's done so much. There's got to be a Charlemagne Joaquin film. Joaquin Phoenix is soon to portray... Napoleon. Yeah, who didn't make your top four. No, He chump. was just edged chump. out by Louis Theroux. Louis Theroux definitely <laughs> hits him to the post. I mean... Is there a Charlemagne Did Louis movie? Theroux ever lose to the British Navy? Mm-mm, don't think so. Don't think so. There is Charlemagne a film. Oh, Carl, Carl Der Grossa. It's a TV miniseries from 2013. Charlemagne the movie is probably back in the 50s or something. Yeah, right? there's like, Charlemagne film from 1933 that is not at all about Charlemagne. Oh, right. There you go. Yeah. Uh, wow. It seems like there's a gap in the market. So I'm going to write the screenplay where I play Charlemagne, obviously. Yeah. I'll play Irene. 
You can play Irene. You can play Pepin well, the Hunchback. Pepin the Hunchback. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And or the icons under my pillow. <laughs> you can you can be the voiceover for the icons under my pillow. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. This week I'm going to talk about Saint Swithin. Swithin. Oh, Saint Swithin, and a happy Saint Swithin's Day to us all. What? Thank you very much. That's exactly right, and that is, um, and I think, an appropriate tone uh, to take, actually. With, this is uh, the only voice one can use when discussing Saint Swithin. <laughs> I mean, so, so one of the things I've realised about Saint Swithin. <laughs> As, as, I'm going to laugh every time you say this. As I've been researching him, is that he's another one of these uh, like medieval figures who was kind of well, he's not medieval at all he's, because he's, he was born in the year 800, which is the link to the year 800. But then he was one of these people that was adopted by the like the the late Saxons and okay. early Normans and early medieval period people, and then they just concocted a whole set of like almost certainly fictional stories about the person mm. and then it became and then it converted I'm from, sorry are you saying someone has made things up about a saint's <laughs> a saintly life yeah how he was, dare you he was like one of these people who was carried you know that sort of we've spoken about it before on the podcast where historians of a certain period considered their role to be writing plausible fiction yeah you yes. know about yeah, history yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and that, that was like what history was it's like jeffrey of monmouth jeffrey right? of monmouth exactly yeah. like this and he's so he basically the since with as we will come to was someone who as far as i can tell had a totally unremarkable life at the time as far as contemporary sources make clear and then later um there then a series of more elaborate myths develop gotcha. over the following few hundred years i really years. hope that happens to me i feel <laughs> i lead a relatively bland and or yeah. dull existence. Yeah. So I need. Do you want to, me to do it? To what? To end it all? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh, no, sorry, start creating some yeah, fiction. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That'd yeah, be great. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It would be a nice twist if I were also the one to kill you. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, that, I mean, everyone would see that coming. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. And I would deserve it. Yeah. Well, that's how the podcast will end. I mean, as, we, as we found out. <laughs> this actually turns into a murder mystery, is what this is. <laughs> True crime. That would be such yeah. good direction to take the podcast. <laughs> yeah. so good. Will tries to crack the case. Yeah. Um, okay, so Saints were then born in 800 and died in 863. And so he was, he was an Anglo-Saxon bishop mm -hmm. of Winchester in England. And then he later became the patron saint of Winchester Cathedral. Uh, and his historical importance as a bishop has been a little bit kind of overshadowed or rather sort of almost like overtaken by his reputation for his posthumous miracles. So, which is to say like, right. it, yeah. it, he's more famous, he's, he's, be he's better known for this like supposed posthumous miracle working mm. than he is for his actual things he did in his life. Yeah. So according to tradition, for instance, if, if it rains on St. Swithin's Bridge, if it rains on St. Swithin's Bridge, which is in Winchester. Okay. Yeah. And it's an actual, this is an actual bridge. Yeah, there's a bridge. There's okay. a bridge. Yeah. We're on, on his feast day, which is the 15th of July. Yep. Ooh, okay. It will continue to rain for 40 days. <gasps> <laughs> it's a variable so, Jupiter storm. Yeah. If, if the so if rain hits the bridge on the fifteenth of July, you've got forty days of rain ahead of you. Okay. And that Continuous. is tradition. Continuous. Yeah. Um. I mean, I'll buy it. I mean, it's which is of course completely preposterous. They <laughs> they would have a, done well to make Saint Swithin's feast day like the fifteenth of Feb. Yeah. Like I bet you could get forty straight days of rain after that. First of March <laughs> they put or something. Up, like, tarpaulins or something to prevent it from happening. <laughs> well it's just so stupid. I mean I can only assume that people are like, oh it's raining on the bridge on, on yeah. the fifteenth of July and then it maybe does rain for the next couple of days and then everyone just forgets yeah. um, about bizarre. the whole thing. Anyway, so that's one of the that's 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 an Except example. The Swithies who who do a tally every morning and live tweet it. That's right, the Winchester the Swithies. The Winchester Swithies. Swithies. Yeah. <laughs> they count in the raindrops. They are. They're great patrons of the podcast, actually. They really are. Uh, so he was uh, Bishop of we uh, Winchester from his consecration on the 30th of October, 852, until his death on the 2nd of July, 863. And he is barely mentioned at all <laughs> in any document of his, uh, of his own time. 
<laughs> so he he uh, he only turns up because he's he has seen uh, or you can see his signature as he witnesses other official documents right, being written. Okay. So he is clearly there is someone there signing do- signing Swithin on documents yeah. um, <laughs> during this period, and he's a co-signer, and he is there. Well, yeah, he's co-signing the documents as a witness, and he is and he was bishop at the time. So there's a second as a record of him being of someone called Swithin being bishop. End of contemporary evidence. <laughs> <laughs> the rest Swithin, is religious miracle. The co-signer. Yeah, it's remarkable. I mean, that that is it. I mean, it's a bit like other figures in history. We don't. We, we don't that might be more contentious to dip into, but like, like the, the contemporary evidence for some of these people is just like incredibly limited. So um, he, he, he does appear in one year in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in the year eight sixty one mm-hmm. when his death is entered into the Chronicle. Yeah, okay, gotcha. So um, that's the kind of level we're dealing incredible, with. Incredible, because like you know, as a bishop, even at that time, you think you'd have some papers or correspondence a, a wax seal or yeah, something like a blog yeah. I don't know a blog like, like something yeah <laughs> the Saint Swithin's blog yeah. so then uh, classically more than a hundred years later uh, when Dunstan and Ethelwold of Winchester were inaugurating their church reforms that were going on at the time Swithin was then adopted as the patron of the restored church oh, in okay, Winchester. Okay, yeah. mm. So they reached back into the past more than 100 years ago. We need someone non-controversial. That's yeah. basically it. They sort <laughs> exactly. of rummaged through the cupboards and said, this guy will do. Who's exactly. the most timid, boring yeah. bishop we've had? And then they sort of ap- appropriated this figure and then sort of morphed him into something that suited their purposes. Amazing. To, to, to create this patron. And then from then on, the rest is fiction, uh, as far as we can tell. So his body was transferred uh, from where it was at the time, which is a basically kind of forgotten grave somewhere, and then moved at, 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 at this point. And then, of course, and this is when the miracles start being reported very conveniently. Well, I mean, of course. Yeah, so at this point, there are supposedly a bunch of miracles that preceded the move of the body and immediately mm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. Miracle one was St. Swithin becoming important. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's just all very, very dubious. So, But then you have the situation where there's, there's this revival in Swithin's fame, and it gives rise to this whole mass of this of legendary literature yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's there's the so-called uh, uh, Vita Swithuni by <laughs> <laughs> the way of the Swithin yeah. which is uh, the lesser known uh, martial arts <laughs> it involves a lot of hiding in closets <laughs> <laughs> and witnessing other state yeah. official documents it's basically <laughs> being a notary public <laughs> Um, okay, so this is written in about about a th- one thousand. Mm. So it's two two hundred years after he's born, one hundred forty years after he dies, and it contains almost no biographical facts at all about Swithin. Um, <laughs> sure. Well, those are harder to make up. Yeah, exactly. So they don't want to be specific he about was a shortish, can... tall man with yeah. fairish, brownish, blackish hair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, and then there are a series of works over the next 200 years to about 1200 that have been described by recent scholars as quote pure fiction <laughs> <laughs> so anyway so this is this is the mention of the guy and, and, and I won't labour it forever but, so, but Swithin's best known miracle like quote miracle unquote was the, was his and this is this is um, uh, about typical of the sorts of claims that are made about mm. him so, so Swithin supposedly um, <laughs> restored on a bridge, so are you right? So he's on a bridge. Imagine he is the scene. Bridge centric, isn't he? Yeah, this guy <laughs> loves a bridge. So he, sorry, sorry. Oh, go on, sorry, sorry. Okay, sorry. so I'm fascinated. This is what's. This is what. This is the scene. Okay, he's, he's on a bridge. On a bridge. Mm-hmm. We don't know if he was standing on this bridge. He's all passing through yeah. the bridge, and then from the other direction, some workmen. Sorry, where is the Balrog in this? Yeah. The Balrog yeah, 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 yeah. is under the bridge. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the Balrog is under the bridge. And and he stood there with his bishop's staff. Yeah. <laughs> and the workmen approach him. And it turns out that these workmen had uh, with them a basket of eggs. <laughs> <laughs> it's already okay. good. It's this is, already this is good. the makings of a miracle. <laughs> it's already 100%. good. So, like, you've got so so. Here we are. So we've got, we've got a bishop on a bridge. We've got some workmen approaching him. Uh-huh. They're carrying a basket of eggs. You to put the bishop and the eggs <laughs> in the boat. Mm. And leave the workmen. <laughs> and then you feed the eggs you to the Balrog. You feed the eggs to the Balrog. No, I'm so sorry. I'm so invested in this miracle. What okay. happened? So the bishop then engages these workmen in conversation. And it turns out the workmen are carrying this this basket, I don't know, like between them. Maybe it's a okay. big basket. But they have, quote, maliciously broken, unquote, <gasps> the eggs. Maliciously? Whoa. Maliciously. Why? 
we don't that that is lost in the in the, <laughs> in the, the murky mists of history. <laughs> okay. And um, all we know that is what all we know for for an absolute fact <laughs> is what happened next. Okay. <laughs> which is that Swithin with Swithin took it upon himself <laughs> to restore these eggs. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> atrocious miracle there was like some guy begging on that bridge who's blind with leprosy and like instead of focusing his miracle energy on that person he's like oh some eggs eggs are a great source of protein and, and maybe they're trying to make an omelette yeah and we all know you gotta break a few eggs that's true mm. saints within the omelette of high cholesterol Cursor. yeah the, the crozier omelet. by the way that big pun crozier is the name of the God bishop bless staff you. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's the, the crooked shepherd's staff. is called oh, a crozier. Thank you very much. C-R-O-I-Z-I-E-R. Now, but what was Gandalf's staff called? Oh, good nerd knowledge. No, for it didn't that, have a name, did it? it? I don't it, know. It I know does. what his sword was called. What was his sword? Glamdring. 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 That's it. Yeah, Glamdring. I don't think his staff had a name. Mm, there you go. Anyway, um, ridiculous miracle. Yep. So he is, I mean, that's just totally preposterous. That's his, that is his best known miracle. How many to be eggs? Clear. Sorry. How many eggs? At least 12. Enough, <laughs> enough that they were carrying it, carrying them in a basket between three able-bodied strapping Jeez, men, right? Big, so really, really strapping. So we have to think that they were, there were probably like 600 maliciously broken eggs. Exactly right. Each individually broken. Yeah. And, with um, malice. Uh, he, so Swithin is also regarded as one of the saints to whom one should pray in the event of a drought. Oh, okay. um, oh, which makes again, there's no particular link whatsoever. Please wet my bridge <laughs> with your yoke <laughs> with my- <laughs> of rain. So, so there you have it. That is basically it on Swithin. Wow, it's um, pretty good. Wow. And and so he's he's a, he's a saint. He's got a day, fifteenth of July. He's kind of associated with rain and unbroken bridge eggs. <laughs> <laughs> On balance, I don't believe a lot of that. <laughs> On balance, I believe every word of it. I'm Team Swithin now. So ridiculous. All right, my Swithies, that <laughs> brings us to the end of another episode. And that was, of course, everything you'd ever need to know about the year 800. So all we have to do is get our next random number generated for us by the random number generator, which is full of unbroken eggs. Yeah, Um, Saints Within has been in here to bless it. That's absolutely right. And the random number generator is set to provide us with a year from between 1000 BCE to 2000 CE. And the year for next time is... 1952. Oh. Oh. That's... Another contemporary-ish year, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Happy birthday to my dad. Oh. Yeah. Maybe we can do your dad's birthday. Hmm? We can do your dad's birthday. Yeah. That's great. Monumental occasion. Monumental historical figure. <laughs> um, that's cool. 1952. That's 1952? cool. We haven't had anything in the 50s, I don't I think. I think that's correct. So if you would like to hear that, please obviously join us next time, loyal listeners. But also please tell your friends. We really want to get the word out there more. Um, I think you're doing a great job. Um, We are getting uh, more and more fan mail, which is good. You can always email us us at our email address, which Anna remembers and I do not. Randomlygeneratedhistory at gmail.com. Or you can go to our Instagram, which is... At randomlyhistory. Or you could go to our Twitter, which is... Also at slash randomly history. Slash randomly history. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry, X. Not yeah, Twitter. yeah, our X. Our X. Yeah. Uh, or our Patreon. Which is? Also <laughs> patreon.com slash randomly history. so hard to remember all this. I know, it's very hard. But yeah, please just do tell people we uh, really enjoy doing this. And if you want to do it uh, with us. Also, it really helps us more than people realise when you go on to Spotify or Apple or whatever yep. you're listening on and, and click the five star thing if you want to leave a five star review. Uh, because it just helps don't... people find the thing, yeah. it turns yeah. out. So thanks Yeah, thank for you. doing that ahead of time. Great. Of time. And Tim Cook, if you're listening, put, yeah. us, put us on an iPod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm sticking Marketing with it. Marketing complete. <laughs> See you next time. Bye. Cool,